Ooh, we're live. We're trying it, popping up. Now we have 11 people there. Hmm. Have you tried the Clubhouse? I got an invitation, but never really tried it. And I wonder what it's like. Maybe this is feel like Clubhouse, you know. I, I drawn the Clubhouse and uh, the blog here for a while, so mm -hmm. I quit. It, it was I blocked, can... right? I heard it was blocked and in China. Yeah, I cannot reach it out, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, somebody asked me to do a talk on Clubhouse, but I haven't. They haven't gotten back to me yet about it. I guess it's just audio. It's like an audio yep. group chat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whatever you want to, they have different rooms and then pick a topic. Pick uh, yeah. who you follow. Yeah. Um, Elon Musk was first. I followed him. That's how I got in Clubhouse. And, uh, um, but uh, I never really attended any sessions. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see whether it takes off or not. Mm hmm. Oh, it's, it's big, uh, particularly in Silicon Valley. They talk okay. about deals all the time, but uh, okay. not politics. That's how they got banned in China. People starting talking uh, politics. And, uh, yes, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we should tell them, just focus on deals, venture deals. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe they could have an AI that any time, the, you know, the word... Oh, uh, yeah. Xi Jinping yeah. comes up that the <laughs> thing turns <laughs> off. Blocked, yeah. Blocked. <laughs> the sensitive words. Um, yeah, right. But if you say, uh, you know, investing, uh, that's like, okay. Mm -hmm. But you can say A and 9 together, um, then you'll be banned. Yeah. Well, we're live. I wonder if we should. I think we're live. I think people. Yeah, we're, we're live. All right. So. I don't know. Do we know? And uh, so, Rob, you want to be the, the moderator? <laughs> you sure you want to be the moderator so we can talk. <laughs> Congratulations, David. You're the moderator now. No, I'm not. You, Rob, you can be the moderator. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll be the moderator. What the heck? All right, from uh, the, the title. <laughs> Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, everybody. Uh, our our real moderator somehow is not able to get on, so I will take over invo involuntarily um, until he joins us. So the session is U.S.-China relations from trade war to tech war. And, um, you know, I guess one question we can ask, it was interesting because I think there's an, there's an important core question here. Which is uh, which, which has come up recently is what is the U.S. motivation here? And, and I think it really matters because it determines a lot of what China does in response. And and I guess the question is, is the U.S. motivation to hold down China? You know, I was back in the Obama era. I was co-chair of the U.S. China Innovation Experts Group. There were six Americans and six Chinese. Uh, experts, scholars. And uh, so we spent, you know, five years, a lot of this focusing on that. And the core, at least in the Obama administration, was not to hold down China, but to get China to play more by the rules, if you will, uh, uh, to be more in letting markets make these decisions rather than uh, government uh, distortions, if you will. Now, you can argue, well, maybe Trump moved a little bit more towards holding down China. But I the end of the day, I don't think that's the core U.S. motivation. Uh, I think it's more about if we could have a level playing field and then China rises on its own naturally, if you will, or through its own entrepreneurial and business efforts. I think the U.S. 
in my sense, many, many people, many, many leaders in the U.S. would be okay with that. They, they'd be fine with that. It's more about the how rather than the what. But I'd just be curious what your all thoughts are on that question. Yukon, you want to? Yeah, let me take a let me, let me take a crack at that. I think it's a very uh, 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 appropriate kind of a question. It's very fundamental, and I think you're quite. Uh, quite on the mark in posing it. And the answer is difficult because there is not what I would call one American view. Uh, I, would, I classify it into three groups. You have the White House, you have the business community, and you have the security establishment. And they each have a view, and these views are not necessarily consistent. So if you go back under Trump, he put a lot of emphasis on the issue of trade deficits, um, trying to generate more jobs in America and also appealing to the, what I would call the, 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 his constituents who tended to be uh, in middle America. So he focused a lot on the purchase agreements uh, and he wanted to penalize China. I don't think he cared too much about the access of U.S. companies or the ability to operate in China. sentiments like buy America or, or trying to generate more jobs, uh, although in theory those jobs could be both services and manufacturing, uh, the focus is still a lot of manufacturing, which I think is a bit misguided because manufacturing jobs are a relatively small percentage of the jobs in the U.S. Then I think the business community, Rob, emphasizes what you just mentioned. They want a fair uh, level playing field. Uh, they don't want to be forced to transfer technology. They want to protect their intellectual property rights. And I think a lot of these concerns are legitimate, but you don't hear a lot of what I call uh, ways of trying to deal with this. Um, the British uh, new bilateral trade investment treaty did address elements of this, but not all of them. Then you have what I call the security establishment. And I think they're really concerned about China becoming a more innovative and technological power and posing a threat to America's domination in this area. And they favor decoupling. And then if you think about it, the decoupling path is quite different from the business path. Business does not really want to decouple. They want to actually have more better access and they want to have fair access. And I think the security establishment view is sort of like became more dominant, mainly because U.S. public opinion of China uh, became so negative. So now you have this kind of decoupling view and you want to keep China away and you want separate systems. And then if you think about it, that's really quite contrary to the business community. And there's also the broader political views which come out from the White House. So from a China perspective, they see these three constituents, they see three different messages, and then there's the general public, and they get different kinds of concerns and messages. And I think that's what you're seeing, Rob, a bit of a confusion out there. Yeah, no, uh, you got that. Was, I think really good way to frame that, uh, that, that, that there really are three camps. I think sometimes, uh, you know, to be simplified, you know, American view of China tends to be oversimplified. We think that we think the CCP is a, you know, there's only one view in the Communist Party and there are multiple views, obviously. And the same thing, I think China tends to think we only have one view and there's multiple different views. David, what's your view from the China side on this? How do, how do you think kind of Chinese leaders think about this question from about what U.S. is trying to do? Uh, so, yeah, so, you know, uh, Rob, uh, a few hours later, of uh, one day later, the two top leaders from China, from the U.S., they will have a meeting in the Anchorage, right? It's uh, Alaska, somewhere, yeah. somewhere. Yeah, yeah, so hopefully they can solve the problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah so no, we need to we need talk, right? So, and, uh, but, uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, the opinions here, a lot of uh, uh, the opinions from uh, different uh, levels, from the leaders, it's, uh, the one, and from uh, people here is uh, different. But uh, some common, uh, some common thoughts from here is like this. So the U.S. The technology is uh, very developed, but the China uh, technology is not uh, is not much behind. It's behind. Someone said it's five years, someone ten years, or even thirty years. Whatever is much behind. So that's why the China. 
uh, the government and also the enterprises, the private and uh, state-owned com companies, they, they, they try to invest uh, more R&D because there's a behind, right? So, and uh, what kind of behind? So that we can see the, the different layers. So the, for, the, for the core technology, like uh, uh, CPU, right? Like uh, the, the IC chips and uh, some uh, some uh, like uh, engines, right? This is uh, the airplane engines. So the China much, much behind with the core technology. And uh, for the application, uh, the, the side this is uh, like uh, software, like application software, like a uh, financial software, like uh, uh, the 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 the, uh, the government software, or the or a lot of application softwares. U.S. China is uh, kind of the same. And another layer is uh, like uh, application areas. So now like a uh, Tencent, right? They, 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 uh, why? Because in China there's a huge market. There's uh, 1.3 billion people. There's a lot, a lot of applications for the, for, 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 for the, whatever the technology, the AI or the face recognition, a lot. So that's China is the even uh, have a better place than the US. So the three layers and this, the, my opinion, so the, China, China has some kind of an advantage and the US has kind of, kind of, of uh, the core uh, advantage. And uh, the, what's the conclusion? conclusion? Conclusion is we need to collaborate together. So co-develop and make both can both both can be developed at a, at a different ways, right? So and the, and also the benefit from uh, uh, different areas and benefit each other because we can match each other for some kind of areas where lack of uh, uh, development and the US they need a market. So that's uh, the 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 people from here they are thinking about that way here it's not uh, we we really we really really want to go to the war right not want to we, nobody want to go to the war I and mean, the fighting like even like a uh, sensitive uh, uh, topic like Huawei or other uh, companies and so if they have a problem or if they had a problem we would do that through the business way, right? So cannot uh, involve uh, like a lot of political issues. So that's a uh, uh, is a mainstream from here. I think. Okay. I think. Right. Great. Thank, no, you. thank you, David. Um, Jerry, you kind of have a foot in both camps, if you will, because your firm you're in New York, but you also part of your firms in Beijing, I believe, or China uh -huh. at least. Uh, yep. Beijing. So you can maybe you can see both sides, uh, maybe certainly better than I can, and uh, and maybe. David sort of maybe sees the China side. How, what's your take on that? This, this um, question. Yeah, I, I would say I, uh, from a technology investor's perspective, uh, I would like to see, you know, a fair playground. And uh, um, I, I mean, I'm more on the Trump's view. I'm not holding down China. It's just like I want to play fair. And, uh, and so it, it's fair to say why is Facebook not a lot in China and the TikTok's a lot in the U.S.? And uh, um from the technology perspective, uh, I, I would say just like fair competition would uh, would be suffice. Say, because um, Chinese government may not understand it's it's not the same thing to invest in nuclear strategy and then uh, you know chips, and uh, you can't really force the market to to do it. And uh, and David mentioned Huawei. So for example, five G technology, you can order the SOEs like China Mobile, China Unicom to adopt China made standards. But you can force the private sector like Huawei. Uh, you had to develop the 5G technology, make a China standard. But you you can't really force other you know countries, other carriers, other technology to adopt your your standard, your technology. It's not that you had to compete uh, in terms you know efficiency, cost, and uh, in order to make a global like 6G, 7G standard. So I would say I, I like to see uh, innovation encouraged, not forced. You know. And central plant economy may not work in the technology sector. You just throw billions of dollars into it. It may not come to, you know, patents or containers <clears throat> or, you know, adoption. It's not there. And uh, just waste of the resources. Uh, but uh, 
we'll, we'll, we'll see. And uh, I, I don't think from a technology perspective, investor perspective, that will be efficient uh, use of capital. Yeah, no, that's an interesting point. Let me also just talk to the audience here a bit. I, since I, none of us were the moderators, they didn't tell us uh, whatever. I see if somebody wants to join. All the, my understanding is I don't think people can join as speakers, but if you have a question or a comment, uh, just put it in the comment field and uh, I'll note it and uh, I'll, I'll read it out uh, as, as we get there. So, yeah, I, so I guess one of the things I, I'm always struck by when I was in China and I visit China is I, I don't think China really understood. Well, maybe they understood and just ignored what the concerns are. I mean, uh, uh, you know, you, 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 Jerry, you just mentioned some of the concerns. Uh, uh, UConn, you mentioned them. I mean, David, you, you mentioned, for example, jet engines uh, or even broader, you know, planes like that COMAC is developing, uh, essentially the equivalent of 737 or chips. And, and I think from the U.S. side, let me just sort of channel what I think the U.S. government would respond to that, which would be, you know, it looks from the outside that China wants to have competitive advantage in, in every sector. And then secondly, I don't think a lot of folks, you know, maybe maybe to Yukon's point, a lot of the national security folks might want to say, we don't want China to be developing these technologies. But I think for a lot of folks in the U.S., it's not so much we don't want China developing uh, jet engines or, or chips. It's we don't want them doing it by putting $100 billion of cash subsidies into it, which is a pretty big distortion. Or we don't want it to be done on, you know, force tech transfer. So I think there's an interesting question about the means versus the ends. And I think there's a lot of people in the U.S. who would say, if the end, if the means are good, you know, uh, I mean, China's doing a lot of really good things in terms of supporting the new five-year plan. Is is advocating for more government support for research, more uh, STEM or you know, science and technology graduates. Uh, Science parks; those are all good things. Everybody agrees with them. But it's, there are other things I think in the in the you know in the in the policy basket that I think are more troubling to Americans, American uh, experts here, and that's I think the challenge. Hello, Doctor Wang. Uh, hello, hello. Sorry, as, 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 I, 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 I was uh, uh, somehow can't connect. Sorry about that. Yeah, no worries. Um, okay. uh, do, do, Oh, John wants to join. Uh, wants the mic. <laughs> yeah. Oh, finally. Great. Uh, maybe maybe I, I could, uh, just I was talking, looking at probably I hear some of your talk, but I cannot uh, join you. Uh, I'm glad. That oh, I there's a drum, right? <laughs> uh, okay. So, John, I've been taking over uh, your your role here, but I'm going to pass the gavel back to you. <laughs> uh, have, Rob, Rob, you. Rob, you carry carry on. I've been on for ten minutes, but I had difficulty getting the uh, video link. So you 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 carry on. You're doing a great job. I'll pop in in a couple of minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, Henry, do you want to introduce yourself? By the way. Okay. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is Henry. Uh, Henry Hui Wang. I'm the uh, uh, founder and the president of the Center for China and Globalization. Oh no! Uh, and their oh, job. No. <laughs> we lost and, uh, yeah, I lost yeah, yeah, That's very strange. Okay. Oh uh, yeah, John, John's back in. All right, there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, just keep going, Rob. Don't worry about us. Uh, we, we, we need, we need to get some forced technology transfer. There we go. Direction into my <laughs> office. Oh, here we go. Wait a minute. Okay, somebody <laughs> just approved Henry should be back. All right. We have another pool. No, I have another click. Yeah, they said approve, approve, but I, that doesn't work when I click. You see, yeah. oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, come on. We dropped them again. So yeah. I guess, I don't know, the way, the way I look at, <clears throat> I mean, I want to go back to Yukon's point. There's the, the national security folks. You know they are going to have a tougher view. They they're going to be wanting to do th things uh, to perhaps slow down China's technological advance. Although I have to say, it never made any sense to me what Trump was trying to do with Huawei because I always felt that that was just shooting ourselves in the foot. I don't know that we might be able to hurt Huawei in the handset business, but I never really believed we could hurt Huawei. We could not. 
we could not kill Huawei in the 5G business. It's a different set of technologies that they have more access to. So I always felt that this notion of going after Huawei and trying to cripple this, it, it never made any sense. Uh, it wasn't, it wasn't to me, it targeted towards a particular goal, like, hey, don't manipulate standards or something like that. It was just, let's see if we can, we can really hurt Huawei. But I think there is a more, in the Biden administration, there's a more strategic, str there will be a more strategic approach. And I guess I'd be curious to see, you know, from, from both our colleagues here who are in China, what do you see as the, as the sort of, resp now I know there's a lot of hurt feelings and, you know, <laughs> lack of trust from the last four years. I get that. But let's say we could kind of come back to that. We're all adults uh, and the Biden team wants to negotiate. What kind of willingness do you see from the uh, Chinese side for, you know, real, real progress as opposed to, you know, lip service progress on some of these? We all know what the core hot button issues are. Um, you know, David talked. About, I'm sorry, uh, Jerry talked about him. Yukon talked about him. So what, what are your thoughts there? But I, I don't know if I'm going to handle this again. Maybe I could uh, jump in. Uh, uh, thank you. I think this is uh, great. I heard some of the you know, talk. <laughs> Uh, I, I think that uh, you know China is really willing to talk. I mean, uh, we have uh, now uh, the official going to meet tomorrow, and we have uh, uh, phase one, which is doing uh, still fine, and uh, China has accelerated by you know in the first two months of this month. And I think maybe we should continue phase one. And I want to start talk about phase two. We should talk about those issues. I think China probably realized now, you know, data flow and things like that. Maybe we have a a much higher uh, 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 standard now than used to, and uh, and I think that uh, you know if Huawei and TikTok and uh, Tencent, WeChat, all viewed as data company, then maybe there could be some uh, reciprocal uh, arrangement. You know, I mean, uh, you know, Google, Facebook, uh, Twitters could uh, could be also um, uh, come to China as well. I I would really think that uh, uh, th there's a huge, enormous opportunity for for US and China to work together. On the, on the technology side. And also, I think the decoupling is really hurting U.S. companies. I mean, semiconductor, there's a committee set it up on those countries. And also, there is a, you know, U.S. General Chairman of Congress just said, you know, the trade war will cost them 0.5 to 1% GDP loss of U.S. and 700,000 jobs. And the uh, Chen just released a report recently saying that, uh, you know, trade, uh, there's not many companies wants to really move back. And then they see China as a huge potential. So I think the digital economy as it is going, you know, with one billion smartphone uh, users. So, so I think that, uh, you know, absolutely, uh, we, we need to really work uh, uh, very, very uh, hard together. I, I think, uh, uh, Bob, you have been the, uh, the uh, you, know, you know, leaders in the, in the Silicon Valley should uh, know this very well. I, I, we actually, I think China is, 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 is now in, in the mood to talk. I mean, that's why last time in Alaska, uh, not in, in uh, Hawaii, this time in Alaska, when when President uh, Trump took office, the president she took all the trouble to fly to Malago. I mean, I mean, China uh, certainly wants to discuss all these issues. I mean, as far as I can see. Uh, but I hope that if we really engage in talks, and the business community somehow is coming back a bit. I think now, uh, you know, with, with China, the economy is still doing extremely well. And, uh, and uh, all the money are coming to China. And Chinese uh, digital uh, economy is already taking 38% of the go. Chinese GDP now with uh, Beijing, Shanghai, uh, Guangzhou past 50%. There's an enormous opportunity for, for U.S. Uh, digital companies. So I, I think somehow we have to sort it out and not really uh, decouple. Sure. sure. Any, but any, any thought, other thoughts there? Okay. Um, one question, I'm going to jump in so we can in include folks. Um, John has a question. What would be a good result from this week's China-U.S. meeting? Obviously, this is a preliminary meeting. We're not going to have any real, you know, actionable decisions, I, I doubt. But what would be a good result to move forward from that meeting? Thoughts on that? Maybe you, Con? Well, <clears throat> my guess is that from a China perspective, they would want something tangible in terms of a change with the Biden administration. Uh, and I think that revolves around the tariffs. If you look at U.S. tariffs on Chinese products, it's gone from about 3% to 20%. And, and that's significant. So China will say, please reduce the tariffs to show that you're interested in talking. And then from the U.S. side, the question will be, well, what, what do I get in exchange? And then there will be a logical uh, statement saying, well, why don't we look at the part one agreement? 
and ask what is the progress and, and what needs to be done. And then I see a problem because China's purchases of American products are about 60% of what it was agreed. So if the U.S. reaction is, well, if you want us to sort of like start removing the tariffs, we want to make sure that you at least agree to what you had committed yourself to. And I think there's a problem here because those purchase agreements didn't make sense. You, uh, there's no way that China could actually buy that much and try to do it through a state kind of agreement doesn't make any sense. So I see a, a problem here in a political sense that an objective set by the Trump administration focusing on the trade deficit and purchases is not really the issue. The issue is, as, as, uh, as everyone has recognized, is fairness in the treatment of the business community, not whether you buy enough soybeans or buy enough liquid. Diet. So that's a problem because you can't get past the first stage. The first stage being you have tariffs on me. Will you reduce it? And then from the U.S. side, well, how come you're not fulfilling your agreements? Then I think there is the next set of issues, which are very difficult to deal with. The sense of unfairness revolves a lot around what I call state subsidies and the role of state enterprises. And the problem here is you can't find a simple way of showing that uh, China is committed to doing something significant. Uh, and as an economist, I've always had a problem because the definition of subsidies varies so much. There's a tendency in China to subsidize activities through banks. It makes sense. You have state-owned banks, and then you basically provide financial support through banks to various kinds of strategic industries. Here in the U.S., we also subsidize. We don't do it through the banks. We do it through the budget. We do it through tax write-offs, uh, deductions. We tend to subsidize the consumer more than the producer. So fundamentally, you have a problem because when you get into the subject of subsidies and saying it's not fair, you have a problem because the economic system in China and the economic system in the U.S. are different. So they both subsidize, but they do it in a different kind of way. And then you have the issue of the state enterprises, and the roles are fundamentally different. So if you talk about the unfairness of the state enterprise sector in China, you can't all of a sudden say to China, you must eliminate them. You can talk about fairness or competitive neutrality. But these concepts are very difficult to define in practice. What I would actually say is the most practical thing to do is you start. You go back to the recent investment agreement between Europe and China. It actually addresses some issues fairly well. Some issues that does not uh, has not really addressed, but you begin by saying, "Well, the agreements, China, that you made with Europe, can we assume that we can reach the same agreements with the U.S.? And then can we agree upon the issues that therefore still need to be addressed in the coming period of time? And if we can agree on that, maybe there is some flexibility on this tariff issue. So that's how I would address it." Yeah, no, I'm curious what other people think. I just would have to say, though, you kind of, I guess I kind of disagree with that framing. Uh, under the sort of OECD definition of subsidies and the WTO definition of subsidies, you know, subsidizing consumer demand is not a trade distortive thing because the consumers can buy it from China or Canada or anywhere, U.S. I do think, though, now, and I also agree with you 100%. I, I, I think the whole trade phase one deal, uh, buying things, I, I mean, that was largely about Trump getting the vote in the Midwest from agriculture. That's what it was. And so it made no sense. That's, the issue is not the trade balance. The issue is much more about this, this fairness issue. In my view, though, China has never lived up to its, uh, it's never lived up to its obligations in the, when, it is, when it joined the WTO to release uh, an open and fully list of subsidies. So State banking is not a, inherently a subsidy, but it can be a subsidy, depending on how the loans are structured and, and, and the like. So I think that would be something that would be, you know, let's have that. Let's have China commit to an annual open and review, a full disclosure of all subsidies, and then see whether they comply with the WTO. And I'd be curious with our two Chinese colleagues, what do you, what do you think of that? Do you think that's a good idea? And do you think it's possible? Uh, it's uh, it's a it's a possible, but uh, you know the time is run, uh, time uh, uh, runs out. And I just uh, two two quick points. The first one I, I agree. So we need uh, the behind the trade deficit. We have uh, the, the the some uh, the different system. But how to do business in in, in different systems? And the one the first point. So we probably started from a common interest. Like climate change, we can we, then we can talk. Now this U.S. China is almost equal, almost 
over there, the decock. And so we start from common interest that we talk and then leave the, the difference away for a while. Uh, that's the, 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 the first one. The second, you know, the government is still keep talking and the people, and the, you know, the, after the pandemic, we need more people exchange. So that's the, we can get back to the normal, you know, in the last year or the last uh, several years, you know, China, US is uh, the relationship, not only the trade or tech war, it's just a relationship is going down a lot, right? So, so even, I mean, the last 30 years, I saw, I just, I just saw the, the poll uh, from the US and there's uh, the, the, the unfairness to Chinese is uh, 80% almost. So that is, uh, is uh, the lowest rates in, in the last 30 years. So we need to get that back first and then we throw fun common interests and put together and back to the uh, to the negotiation, uh, the dialogue. Oh, okay, so. Okay, yeah. so thank oh. you. Uh, just, thank you. One, yeah, one, yeah, just, yeah, quickly. Uh, I think Henry, you know, sorry, I'm gonna, Henry, I'm gonna stop you just for one second. I okay. think they're going to cut us off right at eight. So we got three minutes <laughs> left. Uh, I think that's how it works. And secondly, I want to apologize to the folks who asked questions. We obviously couldn't get to them all, but uh, hopefully. So Henry, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, uh, sorry about that. Yeah, so so I think the Alaska meeting is really to build up the, some uh, dialogue. I think that, that is a really great uh, step. And uh, so seek the common ground and then you know minimize the differences. But I think you know there's a big changes that China recognized now first time at least the one he said the NPC News conference that China recognized you know there's competition. China never said that before. Now it's said, okay. So Trump and Biden think there's a competition, there's, there's a collaboration, and China now also thinks there's competition and collaboration. So let's see you know on this kind of a, a narrative so we can really seek the cooperation while we uh, have a peaceful co uh, competition. Uh, number one. Number two, I think now is that uh, uh, David was right. I mean, we should really uphold the, uh, those global rules on WTO reform. China has, uh, I'm glad Biden has approved the uh, uh, EU and China uh, candidate for the DG of WTO, but also on the CPTPP, where the US designed and high standards of, uh, of trade and uh, technology and all those uh, data flow stuff, SOE reform. Now, China is willing to join that. Let's have a high level talk on that so that we can gradually build up the level playing fields for all of us. So, so I think that's probably the significance of that we talk to each other and it really be the moral responsibility to lead the world forward. Uh, for the US, uh, add on to the system that Britain would have established, so we have put up new, some new Britain with the moments. So I hope that this is really great, thank you. Good, thank you. Um, uh, Jerry, you wanna have any last comments, thoughts? Well, it's just quick word. I guess uh, I'm more pessimistic about the uh, you know the negotiation and damage done. And uh, I mean, even Biden taking a softer you know line, and and but still, it's hard to make a U turn now. And uh, I I would just like I said, I'm pessimistic on uh, what what the results can come out of the you know the meetings. Yeah, I guess you know I would my my own take on it would be. It's one of those things. It, it reminds me. It's like it's like couples counseling when two a couple is you know going to therapy because they think they're got, might get a divorce, um, and oftentimes it's both sides have a thing. I think in this uh, in this case though, but I, obviously I'd say this because I'm an American side. I think the Chinese side has to be the one that comes forward with a few, you know some serious you know a few serious reforms, and I think if they do that. Um, then I think the U.S. I do think the Biden administration is more open than the Trump administration was or would have been. And so I think if China does come to the table with some you know, real serious offers as opposed to. We want to go another five minutes, maybe, or should we wrap up? Uh-oh. Oh. We lost okay. David. We yeah, lost David. Okay. Uh, well, yeah, let me just mention, on, on this issue of having China offer something significant, if you go back a year